the Transportation, Energy, and Utility Committee meeting. I'll call that to order at 559. And the first item on the agenda is the agenda. So I would move to um, amend the agenda by adding a, um, a section, we'll say number uh, 5.5, uh, um, a McNeil next steps. Okay. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all those in favor of? of I second that. I'm second. We have a second. So we have a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, uh, all those in favor of our uh, agenda is amended. Aye. Aye. So we have an agenda. Uh, next item is approval of the minutes from our 523 and our 613 meetings. I move to approve those minutes. <laughs> um, I, I also concur. So um, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, and next is public forum. And I think we have a public forum sign up. Is, is anybody, everybody signed up and wants to speak? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the process going. Um, the first is um, am I, did I get that right? Mercy. Martin Marcy, you can uh, join us here. Um, just, uh, yeah, so maybe state your name for those listening and then go ahead. So I'm Kim Horno Marcy, and I'm here to speak against the expansion of the McNeil plant. Um, I'm bringing you some handouts. This is a handy size of particulate matter, which the top is the human hair. And way down here is wildfire smoke, and here is uh, the particulate matter that McNeil produces. I also have other handouts for you that I'm going to leave with you. I want to actually focus on the health emissions from McNeil. Um, congratulations, it is meeting code but code does not correspond to what medical science says is healthy. Um, currently, according to the American Lung Association review of 2022 literature, scientific medical literature, there is no amount of fine particulate matter that is considered healthy. And your plant by the uh, 2023 emissions report is releasing one ton of particulate matter um, this past year. So um, particulate matter is the stuff that is only slightly bigger than the coronavirus. So nothing in your nose or throat filters it out. It gets right into your lung and right into your bloodstream and it stays there. It's cumulative. So the harms include asthma, heart attack, strokes, cancer, dementia, loss of intelligence, liver damage, fetal and infantile maldevelopment. And we're getting even more of that with the wildfire smoke. So the pulmonary clinics at UVM are off the charts. Every time this wildfire smoke is getting into the yellow, you probably don't notice it unless you have asthma. But it is a horrible impact on anyone with a lung problem, a heart problem, children under 20, those over 65 or pregnant women, nobody in those categories should be exposed to it. And um, there's this myth that McNeil is safe because it needs code, but code is not, not following medical science. So um, in addition to one ton of uh, particulate matter a year, the last report said you your plant was letting off um, 1.2 tons of sulfur oxide, and that also has um, 
many negative effects for human health. It can cause nausea, vomiting, stomach pain, damage to lungs. Um, Long-term inhalation exposure causes chronic breathing um, difficulties. The elderly and children should especially not be exposed to it. Your next um, emission is nitrogen oxide. You release 1.2.6 tons, and that um, leads to damage to lung tissue, breathing, and respiratory problems. Of course, carbon monoxide is your biggest emission at 572.1 tons. And I'm assuming we're all on the same team here, that we believe the climate science and that we're gonna blast through 1.5 unless we stop burning anything. But wood is the same or worse than coal. It's very inefficient. It is very noxious. And when I show this report, which I will leave with you, this is the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation Air Pollution Control Division. This is your 2023 report. Um, this report, when I show it, to people with science understanding and I say, would you like to live next door to this? They won't answer my question because they don't want to be quoted. So it's not exactly a wealthy neighborhood surrounding the plant. It also is letting out VOCs, which cause cancer and other health problems. I think there's plenty of other people in the room who can speak to the climate problem that it produces. But I'm going to leave you. This is um, one of the top epidemiologists, and she's just talking about wildfire smoke in this. But I think you'll find it helpful for your own health. And I'm concerned about those working at McNeil. And I am really concerned that um, we scale it back. You just have the one copy of it? I, unfortunately, I don't have a fancy okay. printer. So, and this is not double sided, but I think okay. you can produce this for yourselves. Okay. This is a blow up of this. And this is your Vermont report. Okay, thank you. Next is uh, Steve Goodkind. He left when he learned he had the but he might be online. Are you online, Steve? You were seven, 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 seven good kind there. Yeah. You with us, Steve? You're muted. I am unmuted now. You're unmuted now. Go ahead. Oh, cool. Okay. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be quick. I know you've got people that are waiting there. I'm, I'm wet, but at least I'm home and comfortable right now from our motorcycle ride home. Uh, just a note, and based on what the previous speaker said, I think you're aware that McNeil has some pretty serious issues with emissions. Some of them may be within standards, some like the CO2 or just they're not within any standard, not even being really counted against this plant. But one thing to note, something I didn't realize till recently is the plan for the steam pipe. I had always envisioned that as waste heat, waste heat that was going to be generated anyway, and we might as well use it for something. But that's not what the steam pipe is. The steam pipe is going to be using steam directly off the boiler at McNeil, the way I see it now. That's not waste. That literally is using wood to produce heat instead of, say, natural gas to produce heat. It's not something where the plant basically operates the same way and the heat is used, someone else benefits. This plant will have to run more and burn more wood to produce the steam for the medical center. And I think you should look at it closely and realize that. So we're not talking about everything being basically the same way or no worse. The steam pipe clearly makes the pollution from the plant worse. I think you just heard some, some of what that pollution might be, but I think it's really important at this point to look at this project and decide, is this our future? Are we really gonna be burning wood? Wood is worse than any fossil fuel. And is that what we're headed for? I'm going to lock ourselves into a long-term commitment to that. Or are we going to take a step back now, not move forward with increasing McNeil's pollution, but with some kind of a deliberate way of phasing McNeil out. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Dean. Uh, next, we have Catherine Bach. 
I start and I just was listening to UPR today and there was a long discussion on heat illness and how more common it is to have heat waves, how they last longer, how they're hotter, how elders and children and people with pre-existing conditions are more susceptible and I thought, well, I guess I must be an elder. I'm almost 75. And uh, I should be afraid of the heat. And that means being afraid to go outside. That means not being able to live as the type of human animals we are who need nature, who need to be outside. Um, and on top of that, I have three children, and they're all saying we're not going to have kids because we see the climate change is so bad that um, they may not even be able to grow up and become adults. So that's what leads me to, on the one hand, be sometimes just wanting to give up and try not to think about it. I'm always amazed at how easy that is to just go along with life and pretend like everything's fine. But I choose to, to try to do something about it. So that's why I'm here. Um, so first I'd like to talk about the resolutions on the detained carbon emissions. And that it seems like uh, making a draft for a plan to eliminate aviation and brown greenhouse gas emissions at the um, detang base by 2030 is something that we need to be doing as a start, just so we know that we're trying to get rid of the emissions. And then the second thing that's part of this uh, proposal is to make known um, by recording the cap with make known a, rec a record of the calculations of the aviation and greenhouse gas emissions created by the base. And then, of course, grounding the F-35 would easily reduce emissions more than anything else that we can do at Burlington. And it would be a lot more pleasant to live in a city. Um, the second is the McNeil steam pipeline. And my question is, will this steam pipeline actually prolong the life of the plant. And it seems to me like it will. And the next question is, do we want to keep McNeil going? Do we want to keep burning wood making um, that causes emissions um, that contribute to climate change? Not to speak of all the other effects of emissions like emissions like Kim just spoke to. So I've heard that the steam pipeline may increase the efficiency of McNeil by 3%, but it'll also require burning more wood to keep enough steam in the hospital. Um, I don't understand all the complexities, but it seems clear to me that we need to stop burning everything and transition to energy sources that have no emissions. Thank you for that. Uh, next is Dan Castrogano. Thanks. My name is Dan Castrogano. Um, got a lot of things to talk to today. Um, I'll also start with why I'm here and then have a few thoughts on McNeil and then uh, the airport too. Um, the past couple of weeks, I've done a series of talks just teaching people about the state of the climate crisis in person and online and recorded the version, sent it around and sent it to the three of you and it really helped me watch it. Um, things are, are really bad, <laughs> to say the least. Um, and just want everybody to know that um, if we just do some rough math, we put about 50 gigatons of CO2 into the atmosphere every year, and we've got about 250 gigatons left until we hit 1.5, which is a 
critical tipping point. Um, that's 2028. So we have to, among many other things, stop burning fossil fuels. Um, and I'm a dad, I have a young son, um, and I'm here for him for a lot of the reasons. Um, and so I'll talk to McNeil and then the Air Force too. But for McNeil, we um, <clears throat> can't pour any more capital into a super polluting plant. Um, we can't invest more money into something that has to be retired. Um, we need a phase out plan. Um, and I think it's exceptionally foolish to ask for millions and millions of dollars to put online. We need to have we need to have a date where it's going to go down. We have to stop burning trees for electricity. Um, and I think, and the other thing too regarding both of these issues is um, these are two super, basically two super polluting facilities that the city owns and operates, and neither is counted in the 2019 Berlin Net Zero Energy Roadmap. And so, if you just write both of these monstrously polluting things out of the language, then you can say net zero, and we all have a party, and it's you know you can't trick the atmosphere. Um, so both of these things have to be counted. The 453,000 tons annually from McNeil and the hundreds of thousands of tons from the airport. Um, I encourage you to adopt the resolution that Pike wrote. Um, the uh, F-35s are super polluters, 22 gallons every minute, right? One minute, one plane, you have 22 gallons right here. That's combusted and then goes straight into the atmosphere. Um, we need to have degrowth at the airport. We need to ban private jets. We need to do a lot of things at the airport, not uh, financially um, incentivize more growth and have endless expansion, among many other things. So the three of you have really important jobs. Um, these are two really important issues. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Um, Jack Hansen wrote in online saying he has to leave, and it's possible he would like to speak next. Um, if, uh, I'm good with that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. You should be able to unmute now. Jeff, you should be able to unmute if you're hearing us. I guess uh, we'll go to Pike, and then if Jack is able to, when Pike's done, we'll... All right, Jack is calling me. Oh, Jack. <laughs> Hello, Jack. Unmute. <laughs> it, I, I don't know. Can they hear you if we put you on speakerphone? Speak. Can people hear me? No. A little bit. No, not really. Not really. Okay, my computer... Uh, up on me. Um, if someone else wants to go, and then I can try to sneak in right after that. We can do that. We'll let Mike go, and then we'll come back to you, Jack. Okay, do you hear that? Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, thank you for entertaining the, the resolution. I, I think I'm in now, but... Okay, we'll, uh, we're going to go to you, Jack. Go ahead. Is that okay, Pike? Go ahead. Okay, thanks. Sorry about that. I have to run to a 630. So I really appreciate it, everyone. And sorry, I've been a stranger at these committee meetings since I have been off the committee. Um, I'm going to change that and get more involved. Um, appreciate the work you all are doing. Um, real quickly on the, I know you all didn't end up taking up the renewable heating ordinance. But I just wanted to share that last night, Cambridge, Massachusetts just um, took a really big step to regulate um, existing buildings and require large commercial buildings to um, eliminate fossil fuel use by 2035. So they're joining New York, New York City and Boston and a few others that have gotten into this. And I really hope Burlington can get on that leading edge and get something thing in place soon because we need a framework to we need a framework in place now to get existing buildings moving because it's going to be a huge task um so want to encourage you all to accelerate progress on that and i'll 
I'll be connecting with you all with specific feedback on the nuances, but I think one piece is like the urgency of getting this policy in place. Um, and then from there, continuing to improve it, but having that framework in place. Um, on the airport, I think this is this is a great step. And thanks to Pike and everyone who's worked on this. This is an enormous source of emissions. And I think the city, it, it, it can be easy. And I know this because I've been in your seat. It can be easy to kind of say, you know, the city can't control this or can't do anything about this. I don't really believe that though. The city does own the airport, right? The city owns the airport. So there's gotta be some leverage. And I think it's a matter of flexing that power that the city does have, but it's gonna take a strong voice and maybe a more unified voice from the city in order to have any leverage, I would say. Um, the only, so I encourage you to move forward on this resolution. The only thing I would say is that I would love to see maybe some more accountability within the resolution for the city, because I worry that the way it's laid out now, it's just asking these other more powerful entities to do stuff. And if they just ignore the resolution, then then what is my concern? I don't see in place follow-up for the city if these entities ignore the resolution. So that would be my only suggestion is something in there that commits the city to actually following up on this issue and st staying on this issue. Um, but thank you all, and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks, Jay. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, thank you for um, finally bringing up the, the resolution that the city council looked at and uh, passed on to, to in November. Um, I believe, Councillor Barlow, you said you wanted to talk to the uh, VTANG before you, adopt, you brought it up here. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the results of those conversations tonight, if possible. Um, back in April, um, Nick Longo presented a um, PowerPoint preservation presentation about uh, emissions at the airport. Um, and, I, and I thank uh, him for finally recognizing that the airport uh, creates emissions above 3,000 feet above ground level. Um, and I appreciate that some of those numbers might get in some kind of document that the airport releases. I believe those numbers should be into the in um, the uh, Burlington Climate Action Plan or the Net Zero Initiative, as they now call it, because we need to count all these emissions if we're going to reduce them. That's the first step. Um, the um, resolution that you're going to consider tonight, um, I think, is a first step, um, but I think it's a baby step. I think we need to recognize that um, 3,000, over 3,000 airports in the country. Um, exist and, and, are, and do very well uh, without um, a VTANG support. Um, so despite what you've heard from the airport um, and McLango and, and predecessors, we can get by perfectly well without fire services um, from VTANG. Other airports do it. Um, and 22 years ago, um, when I pushed a bit, um, uh, Blackwood, Attorney Blackwood at the time, uh, came up with a number of about two, a little over two million is what um, we save for um, fire services there. Um, that is a net loss when you look at the 280 acres that we give away um, every year. Um, and I'm not here to do the numbers with you now, uh, but back to the 20, the April uh, Nick Longo presentation, uh, that was from, he looked at emissions from 2019. I subsequently asked for the data from him and from the city through public records request. And the answer was, well, we don't have the VTAN 2019 data. So I'm bringing it up yet again, because I have to question the numbers if they're presenting numbers and they don't have the data to back them up. Um, I would like the city council and Tuke, we're a small state. And in the end, what we do, um, if we're going to solve the climate crisis, we need to do it by leading. We need to lead by example. Um, forget about net zero. Let's do zero emissions in the, in the electric sector. 
Um, we hear, I guess I'm mix, mixing my topics now, and we hear from Darren Springer that, you know, if um, Nick Neal disappeared, we have to buy um, uh, on from the uh, ISO New England grid, and it would be uh, natural gas. 60% of our, our um, electricity comes from um, hydro, and the other 30% uh, or forty percent could come from hydro if there was planning. I sent to you um, the Northfield uh, pump station information uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there's just not any real planning ahead to phase out McNeil, and there needs to be. But back to the resolution. Um, I think that um, that as a first step, things need to be counted, and as a second step, um, we need to if um, the Air Force and B10 cannot reduce their emissions, we need to ask for a non-flying mission. The city council asked for a different mission, flying mission, um, a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, sometime during the pandemic. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, I can send that resolution out to you. Um, it's time to go back and say, we would like a non-flying mission because we need to reduce our emissions because people are dying, uh, because this is an existential threat, um, because the mayor said so in April. And then moments later, explain how we need to expand the airport. Um, I'm rambling now, I know that, but um, so that's, I'm sure there's a lot more I want to say, and you'll, I'm, you, and you know you're going to hear it from me via email. But uh, thank you, thank you for taking this up, and thank you for listening. Thanks, Mike. Next, we have uh, Colin Larson. <clears throat> Hi all. Uh, so I know you, you've heard a lot already about uh, climate concerns, about air quality concerns, about all, all of that. Um, I, I do want to remind you all of the Global Warming Solutions Act passed by the state. Um, the state has a target that we have to meet in two years, in 2025. Um, based on testimony from the Affordable Heat Act um, from the last legislature, we're not on target to meet that. We cannot afford to not take a whole of government approach when it comes to reducing emissions. And that includes the airport, and that includes McNeil. And that starts with proper accounting, which we're not doing right now. So, um, you know, this is kind of, it seems like that the airport has kind of been this like thing that no one wants to take responsibility for. The airport commission has kind of passed on, on taking this up. Um, the, the state even barely mentions aviation. It's, it's carbon um, footprint, uh, you know, pathway. So we need a little bit of leadership here, and I think this council can do that. Take this up, pick up the resolution. Um, McNeil was kind of. I do want to talk about that a little bit, so I'll just I'll just move to that now. And the forty million dollar expansion for this steam pipe project, as others have said, this will prolong the life of the plant. Um, we shouldn't be doing that. Uh, that money can be much better spent elsewhere, especially if we're planning long term for you know green energy production. When we phase out McNeil, think about what that forty million um, could do. Um, in addition, we know McNeil is going to be losing revenue as the end of this sort of carbon offset scheme that other states have purchased from it. Um, so we also have to ask ourselves: Is this plan even financially viable at this point? And if it's not, why are we going to prop it up with additional investment? Um, so. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Next up is uh, Connor Works. Uh, hey, all. Connor Works, uh, Living in Ward 2. Nice to be here. Thanks for listening. <laughs> um, did you all get the part about the carbon offsets and that sort of thing? Or, like, did that like make sense? Renewable energy. renewable energy credits and, and stuff like that. Um, okay, just wanted to check. Um, so I, I guess I was thinking about uh, if you're talking next steps, um, I think what is implied in a lot of this, like, oh, like, hold off on McNeil, we shouldn't be expanding McNeil, um, is that we need to figure out what else we can do. <laughs> and um, I actually think that maybe that's something that um, we can work on together as, as constituents, activists, and um, y'all as subcommittee is like, yeah, well, what is next? What is the plan that 
that could potentially replace McNeil um, if if we wanted to go down that line. And so I feel like that that feels like a pretty natural, um, reasonable next step after the symposium is to you know commission a study and be like, what would it look like, and how long would it take, and what does that mean? Um, and I was reading up on you know BED's like district energy plan and. They're spending a ton of money on a plan like figuring out the, the proposal for that district energy like hundreds of thousands of dollars and i think that a, a, a plan for like figuring out what other alternatives for burlington's electricity would be would certainly not cost that much like um and so i figured it might be something to consider if, if that's at all possible um and if that's not within your like wheelhouse and you need support with that um i think that's something that you know the activists and organizing community might be able to to help with as well so um if that's at all possible just you know let us know and we'll try our best to help out as, as we can um so yeah and then i you know reading up about the lead saying resolution i just want to say that i certainly support that and it certainly seems reasonable at least to count the emissions so we're we'll looking forward to the discussion today Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next is uh, James. I made it copies. Put three of them. Um, so the city of Burlington, as Jack Hansen mentioned, is owns the airport. It's the airport proprietor, and he said he thought that. There must be some way the city can use that to take action at the airport to on behalf of emissions. And uh, so I'm going to lay out how the city can do that. Um, there's federal law and there are FAA grant assurances. The airport gets these grants and has to sign a contract with the Federal Aviation Administration of Flights Grant. And those grant assurances lay out what the federal law is regarding limits that the air that the city can place on aviation at the airport. And there are things the city can do. Um, they enable municipal airport proprietors to establish non-discriminatory standards so long as they apply to all the aircraft using the airport. That's the basic rule for standards that the um, city wants to apply. Now, exercising this power to set a non-discriminatory fuel efficiency standard is the lowest of low hanging fruit available to the city that's consistent with the city's declaration of a climate emergency. The city has the authority to ban all gas guzzling aircraft from BTV. And the reason it's low hanging fruit is that the city can do this without any cost to the city. Just set a standard. You don't have to, like in Flint, Michigan, re-pipe the city to save all these emissions, all these problems with lead. It's like impossible there. Yeah. But here, just set a standard. Doesn't cost anything. You can save emissions. Most commercial passenger airliners get close to 100 passenger miles per gallon, and some get 120. The F-35 only gets 0 0.5 passenger miles per gallon, 200 times less. Most of the luxury private aircraft, the ones that exclusively serve a tiny fraction of the 1%, get between 10 and 45 passenger miles per gallon. So Burlington can use its airport proprietor authority to establish a minimum passenger miles per gallon standard or the equivalent in tons of cargo miles per gallon. 
and setting it at 50 passenger miles per gallon. We cut out the gas guzzling luxury privates and the climate killing F-35. And you can do it under the federal law and grant assurances as long as it's non-discriminatory. But I'm gonna I'm gonna argue that what they're doing now at the airport is discriminatory. And by doing this, you'll fix the discrimination. Okay, so the FAA itself only has authority to require civilian aircraft to meet, I'm gonna go switch to noise now, to meet its noise standards. The FAA doesn't have authority to regulate military jet noise anywhere in the country, any kind of military. But the city's airport proprietor authority gives it the power and actually an obligation that the FAA lacks. Without intending to, the airport is currently applying the FAA standard in a grossly discriminatory manner. It allows the FAA, it allows the F-35 to use the airport for hundreds of train flights each month, even though that aircraft wildly exceeds the FAA noise standard that limits the noise of all civilian aircraft. That's discrimination. All these F30, the F-35 gets the ability to do something the civilian airline, the civilian flights of all kinds cannot do under FAA rule. So the airport could simply apply the exact same FAA noise standard and make it a, a level playing field for all the aircraft. Okay, so just doing that, just saying all aircraft at this airport must meet the FAA standard. That's already there. That's applied for civilian aircraft. Every aircraft has to do that. Nobody can complain that you're being discriminatory if you're applying the same standard for civilian to the military for noise. And that would solve the F-35 problem. It would make it illegal for the F-35 to do that because it's discriminatory to be allowing it to make this huge amount of noise where the rule, you know, all the rules at the airport provided by the FAA don't allow that for civilian aircraft. Now, one of the most important purposes of the FAA noise standard is to protect the public, particularly children. Children are deeply affected by this incredible noise. Not only their hearing, but their cognitive development. And we've heard that from the chief pediatric neurology at the University of Vermont Medical Center. And we've heard, and you can read all kinds of papers showing that the noise at this level. In fact, the Air Force itself admits that this is a huge problem. So the city has the airport proprietor's authority to do two things. First of all, to end the gross discrimination by establishing a requirement that copies the FAA standard and applies it to all aircraft so that there are no exclusions or exceptions, and it includes the F-35. And I have on the back of this sheet where I copied from the FAA grant assurances so you can see for yourself what the rules are. You know, thanks. Um, can, you, can you wrap up? Can you wrap up? Yeah, I just have some other speakers. I just have one more minute. The Burlington government may be unique in knowing about a severe harm to more than a thousand children who live in the among the six thousand people in the extreme noise zone, and it has and it knows it has the power to stop the harm without any cost to the city, and it's still not using that power. 
How could that be explained? Nowhere else in the country is that being done. So under the leadership of this committee, Burlington can do much better. And I'm urging the TEUC to submit draft ordinances to the city council that implement the airport proprietor power to set fuel efficiency standards and to set noise standards for the airport. That would be non-discriminatory and would fix these problems to save both the planet and the children now. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. And we'll just we'll conclude this with the reference to Mr. Okay, next up is Benjamin. Is it Whitner? Okay, thank you. So I'm a little underprepared today. I feel really honored and frankly quite privileged to be able to speak to the future of the state and uh, which can have rippling effects, let alone potentially influence something. That would be another high hope of my being here. But um, please bear with me because I'm new to public speaking. Um, yeah, so I think regarding the tree burning plant, what's the name of that again? McNeil, yeah. McNeil uh, plant. Uh, so apparently that's very dirty emissions. And in regards to the climate, that's what we want. We want to have dirtier emissions because aerosols are the, while they are the least understood component of climate science, they're clouding about 50 to 100% of the warming effects of the emissions, which implies that the increase in emissions in the atmosphere is due to the planet's inability to reabsorb them through the ocean and other carbon sinks like peatlands and rainforests. Um, so we let we as far as the global warming is good, we want dirtier fuel. Let's bring back the coal, let's let's start burning more trees. Because that's going to cloud the, but we have another problem there because that hurts people's breathing. Over, I don't know exactly, but about seven million people lose their lives each year to atmospheric pollution, completely unrelated to CO two levels. So I just want to put the human condition at the center stage, and because this is these are the lives that are most valued, um, and is the center of our debate is the quality and maintenance of our of our societies. Um, and regarding the jets now, they have very clean fuel, which is better for the short term lung health of people, although it's very potent CO2 that has it's all greenhouse gases when you burn the jet fuel. So things like that are extremely um, impactful uh, compared with all other kinds of greenhouse gas emissions, it's more impactful than, than the kind of fuel you use to drive your car. Um, so, but honestly, that's my last concern regarding the jets. That's at the bottom of my list because no one told me about the jets. You know how I found out about them? I, I moved to Winooski and I said, well, this is just, I can't handle it. It's not physically, I, I'm a person with a history of physical, mental health um, struggles that uh, worked through during that time, but the Jets were not an okay part of that for me. So I went and found an online group. How can we address this? How can we make this place more habitable? And to dovetail off something James said, Yet the chief of pediatric neurology at UVM did come out with a formal statement comparing the damaging effects of the jet noise to lead exposure in young children. So the fact that that's not the first concern in protecting people's health and particularly the young people's health is, I don't know where the, the human concern got lost, but there's a disconnect between the heart and the mind that has to be regained. We have to 
get reconnection. So we are not prioritizing violence and um, uh, extremely destructive mach machine practices over the conscious lives of individuals who are going to be responsible for guiding this ship of humanity into the future. Like very real stuff, it seems abstract, but we're all going through this process together. And so I, that's my big question is why aren't we talking about people's health and people's mental health and the childhood development? And we're just seem to be greenwashing everything as if human values don't matter. The only thing we care about is a number in the sky. And um, so I think we really need to get our priorities correct. Like, I don't know exactly the role we all play in this, but I think if we start thinking in a more unified way about how to address ecological catastrophe of which climate change, global warming is really just a small symptom which is causing flooding and wreaking havoc uh, and specifically in low lower island places not necessarily in America right now but America you know is part of we're all connected right now it's just poor people in low uh, sea level nations like Bangladesh who are millions are losing their homes due to flooding and this is obviously not our direct responsibility or a direct fault but we as vermonters have a lot of influence in the most powerful country on earth the united states of america and because we have two congressmen the pizza monster and the spaghetti monster so um that they represent our state and um um i was just surprised bernie sanders didn't step in He's a spaghetti monster is to protect our um, our our people, our citizens. You know, how he cares about monsters. And then the other guy is the pizza monster. So then, and I think that we have a lot of power to influence their decisions and to be real players, real peacemakers, rather than just you know working together with the aviation industry who puts industrial enterprises all over the country to glean political influence, which we're just playing right into uh, using our, our quality of life uh, just as a gift, I guess, for, for these violent um, proclivities that, that somehow happen, I think based out of fear, not out of conspiracy or, or a love of catastrophe, but just out of fear, really, and there's no need for that because everyone wants to work together and we all want to protect our families and the future. And so, yeah, I'm rambling here, but I, I'm really grateful for you guys' gracious um, um, uh, audience. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thank you. appreciate it. Um, I think that's the end of our in-person comments. I'm just going to time keep for us a little bit. I'd like to wrap public comment up in the next at 6:48 by 7 at the latest. So um, please uh, keep that in mind as you uh, comment. And our next speaker will be Ashley Adams. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi. I'm. Hi, thank you. I'm here to support Pike Porter's B10 greenhouse gas resolution. And I really appreciate that you're taking it up this evening. And I hope that you agree that it should be passed. Um, I think that we know from the McNeil Biomass Symposium on June 13th that it's time for truth telling around carbon emissions. Um, whether those emissions are from burning trees at McNeil or doubling down on McNeil by spending 42 million on a misguided steam pipe to the hospital and thereby burning yet more trees or from passenger jets or from the F-35, Burlington really owes it to us, to its residents, to our children and to future generations to start telling the truth and counting all emissions. Um, the aspirational language such as that contained in the Air Force Climate Action Plan in Burlington's 2019 declaration of uh, climate emergency is really just meaningless if it isn't backed by action. Um, beyond accurately accounting greenhouse gas emissions from all sources, 
Such actions should include calling for a non-flying mission for the F-35, which burns 22 gallons of fuel per minute, causing damage to our environment, in addition to daily harm to the human beings who live around the airport. We need to tell the truth, not only about emissions, but about the injustice of this plane spacing in close proximity to densely populated communities. And let me tell you, it is real suffering. I don't live in it, but I work in it. And I invite you to come over and, um, and experience the bottle, the bodily, um, the, the real pain that it causes to human beings. We aren't, we aren't built for that. So just to leave you with this, and I know there are many others who'd like to speak, the window on making difficult but deliberate decisions is quickly closing on climate. And I really just hope that we choose to make these difficult decisions today rather than allowing them to be made for our children through the chaos of ecological collapse. And thank you for taking my call. Thank you, Ashley. Next is Peter Duvall. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to comment. Peter, can you, I think you're- Can you hear me? Yes. As the first word in the name of the committee is transportation, I should mention that true modern Roundabouts are an FHWA proven safety countermeasure, the best available for intersections, more efficient, lower emission, several times, not just a few percent safer than signalized intersections. For a traffic engineer charged with providing a safe roadway for motorists, let alone pedestrians and cyclists, it is a dereliction of duty to choose to construct new signalized intersections. There are a number of new signalized intersections planned for the Southern Connector Champlain Parkway. It should never be opened to motor traffic for many reasons related to urban planning and climate response, but especially for the city's failure to design a safe roadway. Search proven safety countermeasures measures at the Federal Highway Administration's website for advice to traffic engineers about highway safety. Energy and utilities are also words in the committee's name. That overlaps with the Burlington Electric Light Commission's specific turf. But when the commission makes mistakes managing the electric department, it's everyone's duty to step in and help them correct those management errors. An essential aspect of managing a utility, an expectation of regulators at the PUC who approve major decisions and rate increase requests is prudence. It is the test of a utility's decision. Imprudence leads to rate case denial and bankruptcy, as in the case of the investor-owned utilities in the aftermath of the 1990s Hydro-Quebec-Vermont joint owner's contract. There are lessons to be learned from that mess. Right around the same time as the big utilities were leading the small utilities toward financial disaster, I had the honor and pleasure of joining bureaucrats and environmental groups, and many of those same utilities technical staff in the Public Service Board's docket 5611 investigation into environmental externalities. This was in 1992 and 93. We spent many months meeting with experts, listening to the best researchers about all sorts of environmental impacts of utility decision-making. Ultimately, a rule was drafted which excluded forest biomass from the definition of qualified renewable resource. And I will read from page 14 of draft seven. Qualified renewable resources will be excluded, will exclude rather non-sustainable, that means open loop, which is a federal uh, statutory definition, yield biomass, comma, 
conventionally fired biomass, that's McNeil, a conventionally fired power plant, and hydroelectricity. Further, uh, I should note that on page 13, uh, natural gas combined cycle plants were used as the reference case so uh, for emissions. So anything that had worse emissions than, than that had no uh, business being used as a, um, uh, an improvement over business as usual. I, I point all this out to uh, alert you to the fact that regulators <clears throat> and utility companies have been well aware of the fact that biomass plants are high polluting power plants. There's no escaping that knowledge And it's very important that the TUC and the city council exert some influence on BED's decision-making because it's been quite incompetent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter. And our last speaker is Cheryl Joy Lipton. Hi. Um... Yeah, I'm down in Chester, so I don't live in Burlington, but this affects me just as much, except for the fact that I don't have to, um, I don't have to have the pain of having the F-35s fly over me. Um, though periodically, <laughs> something does, and I, I wonder if that's them coming down here. Um, so I officially want to support the VTANG resolution. And I want to point out that there's another issue that um, isn't getting as much attention as climate change, and um, uh, as it, and but is just as important and critical. And it's the biodiversity emergency or biodiversity crisis. You know, we just had um, so burning wood is is driving excessive logging and destroying habitat for forest species, and uh, um, as well as uh, destroying a free and very effective solution, um, which is the forest. And uh, it's, it's um, increasing already. The, so when biomass is burned it, it is, and destroying this forest is increasing already overpopulated um, deer population that's also not allowing any cut forests to regenerate and to regrow. When biomass burning is continued and expanded, um, such as is happening in Europe, and um, as will happen as you continue to burn um, and um, continue uh, McNeil and even increase it by using this, um, this scheme to continue it by the steam transmission, more deforestation occurs. You know, we're losing forests all over the place, everywhere. It's contributing to climate change and biodiversity loss. And we have see it happening down in the south to fuel the plants over in Europe and around the this country. Um, our forests here are just as important as the rainforests are. Uh, on, and even though we, we mostly focus on those for some reason, um, McNeil is fueling more logging in this time that nationally we're, we're trying to focus on our lack of old growth forests. Um, and uh, after hearing about the urgent biodiversity crisis from COP15 up in Montreal recently, um, and, and Biden's uh, uh, focus on that last Earth Day and this Earth Day, right now we have as much um, old forest as the amount of young forest that we're supposed to have. We're only supposed to have one to 3%, maybe a little bit more of young forest, all in very tiny patches. And um, McNeil and, and its burning of forests is increasing both climate change and biodiversity loss. Um, you've heard a little bit about that already. And um, I think I'm going to 
finish up since you want to stop at seven, but I could talk more about the biodiversity loss fueled by McNeil, but I think we, and, and, well, not just McNeil, but burning biomass in general. Um, so please do not continue working with bio, with um, McNeil and, and really take the, the ethical move to phase bio, uh, biomass burning out, phase out McNeil and don't continue using it. It's, it's unethical and, and everybody has eyes, your eyes have been opened, you've seen the data and you've seen, seen the truth um, and it's time to move on away from burning up our forests. And thanks, thanks very much for listening to me because it's just as important to me down here. It's it's affecting my world and my breathing. Um, I have asthma and I don't need it to be exacerbated by this. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Um, and I'm going to close public comment. Um, if there's anybody who didn't have a chance to speak tonight who wanted to and wasn't on any of our lists or had their hand raised, you can submit um, comments uh, to us and I'll make sure that they get attached to the meeting. Um, our next item on our agenda is the North Nooski Avenue update. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Jacob. Great. Thank you. And for, uh, yes, indeed, I think I gave you two copies there. Um, I just, yeah, great. Uh, there are other copies for members of the public if you're interested, and it is posted online on the committee's webpage for anybody calling in who would like to see. So um, I am following up from the April 17th council meeting where um, the council passed a resolution, I think brought forward by uh, Councillor Bergman here uh, to refer to the Tuke work on um, studying the uh, the impact, positive and negative, of the North Winooski Avenue uh, corridor study. And um, we had a conversation at the uh, May 3rd uh, meeting of the TUC, and staff had agreed to propose some draft uh, scope of the uh, proposed draft scope of work. And what we have here in the memo are uh, four main areas that we are proposing the staff to bring forward uh, for that evaluation of North Winooski Avenue after implementation of the lane reassignment. Safety, uh, we're proposing to collect crash data over the next two years. Two, uh, parking utilization and conducting uh, at least twice a year, day and evening occupancy counts on the two block corridor and one block uh, deep on the adjacent side streets. Uh, bike pedestrian counts, uh, we have worked in the past with the CCRPC to facilitate those counts and would uh, seek to do that again. And uh, we've been in touch with the business and workforce development about undergoing a stakeholder survey for uh, adjacent stakeholders along the port or residents, organizations, businesses, etc. There was also uh, a discussion at the meeting uh, on May 3rd about a parking and transportation equity analysis. Um, we would like more opportunity to discuss that with you and understand your interest. Uh, there was some discussion about trying to understand the, the amount of publicly available parking and transportation resources in each uh, commercial district. And I think each commercial district in Burlington is its own different set of interests and assets. And there are already some studies underway, such as the city's TDM study, that may be trying to accomplish some of the similar work. So we would like to have a, a greater conversation with you all around how, uh, how that interest uh, would be carried forward. Uh, some final comments here. Uh, we're proposing that the four areas that we're proposing to study uh, the metrics on, we'd like to wait for a period for the public to settle in to the new, new corridor as often uh, uses uh, shift and changes. People are getting accustomed to the changes. 
Uh, next, I wanted to just highlight that uh, we have already, uh, and under my initiative, have uh, directed the parking services team to have a one month warning period for the parking changes in the corridor. I think that many members of the council have asked about how the changing regulations would impact uh, low income folks. And so we wanna give people a chance to learn the new parking regulations along the corridor. In addition, as part of that, we have gotten the commission's approval, the Public Works Commission approval to lower the parking violation fines for a time limited violation down from $75 to in July, $20. We're continuing uh, staff to work with Community Health Center and trying to assist with their off street parking needs. Uh, I have met with them I think three times since we've uh, last discussed this. Uh, Public Works has shared five conceptual options for off street parking to them. We're waiting to hear back uh, which ones, if any, are kind of uh, supportable, uh, are uh, their preferred alternatives. and. Uh, as I've indicated to committee members in emails, I've committed to them that I will work to find additional funds to support additional design work should there be a viable design that they would like to bring forward. Paving is scheduled for the week of the 16th. They're finishing up structure work now, which is adjusting manholes and water valves and gas valves, and then are planning to pave in two to three weeks. Uh, the changes to the lanes and the addition of bike lanes uh, and the consolidation of parking will happen uh, concurrent with that final layer of the asphalt. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, any members, questions? I, I do, but. You can go ahead and then I'll go after. Okay. Uh, let me uh, start with the additional first additional comment. Sure. Bullet. Um, it seems to me that we need to have a baseline from right now. So I understand the, the waiting, um, uh, and, but I think that it's important that you know what is happening before the changes and then making that, um, that delay to see how things are going. I don't, you know, uh, how long did you say in here? It's, it's not in the, the, the comments. But I, and you, I think you mentioned uh, something that I yeah. missed a couple of questions. Then. Each one, uh, safety, we can count from the get-go. Uh, it'll be something we look at annually, the crash data each year. Um, the parking. Parking utilization uh, was proposing biannual. Uh, we, so I, so I mean, yeah. I, I think that, you know, like when these things you were looking for things to settle in. Yeah. So I, I think that in terms of parking, we need to know what's happening now before the changes have gone on. So that that's my comment on that. I would love, depending on the resources that we have available and whether we can um, try to get some more free even um, resources. Uh, biannual seems not to be um, to be enough. I'd like it at least quarterly, but uh, you know, and I think um, the the different times of the year kind of have a have an impact. And I think that it's not clear from the um, from the memo what the frequency of the bike pedestrian traffic counts are and um, it's also not clear the um, what the streets are that are going to be but you know ultimately um, having reasonably um, spaced um, counts okay so I, I think biannually that's twice a year I, I, I think is not sufficient enough. Uh, I would think that the stakeholder survey, it would, I, I, three months I think is, is okay. I think six months, you know, is, is a decent follow-up one, six months out. I, I would like not to, I, I think it's too long on that. So just lay that out. 
And I would um, actually request that you go back to the uh, the commission and extend the reduction in the parking fees um, to say not just to, to, to July, but I would like them push back to to September as well. You know, so that you you got we we're getting through the UVM um, student in uh, not in college but their failure to, to house their students, more and more students moving into uh, to War II, my, my ward. And as a result, the demographics change in the summertime, um, starting in late August, students start to move back into, uh, into the city. Um, and so I think it would be um, best to uh, extend the, uh, the reduction of the um, parking violation um, fines uh, into September beyond the one month. I don't think the one month is, is sufficient. And that is the sum of my comments right now. Do you have any data on how many warning tickets? you've had to give out, like, has there been an increase in the amount of tickets or is it kind of re reasonably the same as it, as you normally say? Right, the new parking regulations have not gone into effect yet because the paving hasn't happened. So uh, the, the change is that they're currently time limited parking changes on the street. I don't think they are significant changes, but there are more parking limited spaces that will be added and they will be in different spots. So we don't yet know how the learning curve will go for the community. So uh, the thought was to have a one month warning period, which is far more than what I have been familiar with for changes on street. But since there are global changes on a two block corridor, we thought it was reasonable if uh, the TOOP would like us to extend that, um, we can certainly have that conversation. So we don't know yet um, how much how much uh, learning period, how much uh, effort it will take for the public to understand how to park on uh, the street. There will still be unregulated spaces, but there will be more time on these spaces. So just to follow up on that, yeah. if we get a lot, if you have to issue a lot of warning tickets, my suggestion is that right. we expand that, right? So, because it's obviously not working. I think that is a fair comment, uh, Councilor Bergman. And uh, I agree, if we notice that there are a lot of warnings, then uh, I can use my authority to extend the warning period. I, are you done? Yeah, yeah the, the last thing is just data again coming back to the two yes um with data on sort of all this stuff so i've asked you for for some changes but whatever data that is relevant to parking utilization to ticketing uh to other things thank you we are fully ready and you know my apologies for uh last minute uh, cooking here but we're busy it's construction season uh in the memo right under the proposed metrics we do commit to coming to the took and the dpw commission with the metrics that we uh that we collect and absolutely want your feedback on uh, the metrics and what changes if any need to be made i've been accused of last minute itis and you know like i'm okay with getting stuff done there we go if it has to be done now then it has to be done now Thank yeah. you. Um, I, I just uh, I have two questions, but I'll follow on on the uh, the parking one. Does the OOPS uh, program apply to the time limited spots or only to meter violations? Yes, they would apply to any violation that is not a uh, safety violation. So here to corners, illegally parking in a handicapped spot, things that prevent parking in front of a hydrant, those are things that OOPS wouldn't apply to. Okay. But the other non-safety violations OOPS would apply. And for those listening and who don't know what OOPS is, it's a forgiveness program that um, allows you one sort of get out of fine free per year, I believe. Yes. Um, and so that would apply here and it may actually take um, 
you know, might be used as a tool in this idea of uh, trying to, you know, um, bring people along and phase them into changes along the corridor. Yeah. Um, my other questions around the stakeholder survey, I think this is a really um, powerful tool for us to use. And so the first is what, how do you view an adjacent stakeholder, just someone on the corridor or would this be like, I mean, will, will it be like by invitation or will it be open? I mean, because there, 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 there are ripple effects to parking removal on the corridor that that um, impact adjacent streets that are on the corridor, but um, so I'm just wondering right. how, how that's envisioned. Um, you don't have to answer now, it's still being thought about. I think we, in my mind, it was, I was imagining two levels, one direct stakeholders, those who live or work on North Winsky, that we would work with the business uh, and workforce development department and maybe counselors and others to canvas the street, get information, make sure we directly reach those who are immediately on the street. I would imagine that we you know, have a question, of where do you live on, in the beginning of the survey and that the survey could be filled out by folks on adjacent streets. From a resource standpoint, I think it's most important that we hear from the immediately affected, but then adjacent, as you point out, there may be important impacts that we need to consider. And, and then, and then the the survey questions themselves would be. I understand that you need someone who's skilled in the art of survey development to yeah. create this, but it'd be nice to have um, a look at it before it's um, yeah. it's uh, given, because we might, it, you know, we'd be able to see if there's any gaps or additions that we might want to add to it. I am happy to share a draft. Uh, on that, given the um, interest that CHT expressed in the entire process that has led us up to here, um, have you um, reached out to Champlain Housing Trust, which has buildings there um, on the corridor, um, just to enlist their assistance in um, communicating with their residents, and if not, can you add them to the uh, the list of folks to be working with? Absolutely. We um, we worked extensively with them on the parking management plan. I talked to the CEO, Michael Monti, as we were discussing shared parking options. I have not talked to them recently about communication, but more than happy to engage them as part of the, the, the stakeholder survey. I, I think that is absolutely essential. Um, they're probably the, the biggest organization yeah. that is connected with, with residents who are living on the street yeah. in areas adjacent to. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Please we'll close that item out then and move on to item number five, which is the resolution on detailing carbon emissions. This was referred to us um, by May. Mark, there's a point of order in terms of agenda that I just want to let you know about. I've sent the walking tour uh, team home, given how long the public forum and the agenda items were going. So I hope that was friendly. Give, it was hard to break in, so I made that executive decision. Okay. So that item, we can do it a subsequent meeting. Okay. But I'm happy to give a brief verbal update on some key elements and leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, right. Given the... Uh, the way the meeting, the length of the meeting, the yes. way it's running, that might be uh, that is friendly. I think uh, the council is friendly. Great. So thank you for that. Um, so, item number five resolution on VTAN carbon emissions. Um, this was came from a communication to the full council that was referred to our committee back on 12 6. And, you know, I'll, I'll be Take, take responsibility for not getting on getting it onto the agenda until now, but it's um, um, something that um, that we're taking up tonight. Um, so I don't have uh, really much of an intro. Everybody has the resolution. I'm. It was it was given to us without any specification on what we're to do with it. So I'm. I guess we're considering it as a committee tonight. So I would take input from. Yeah. 
the committee members. Go ahead, Jim. So I like the resolution. I would make a, a, a stylistic change in switching the uh, resolve clauses around, and I am um, sympathetic or supportive of counselor, former counselor Hansen's call for um, the city to have more accountability or follow up. And so an additional either building into the existing uh, resolve clauses or having an additional one to invite VTAG to the two to communicate with us is what I've come up with uh, for that. But I would actually like for this committee to sponsor this resolution and then send it back to the council for uh, consideration. Um, I think just to make clear, I also think that there are, um, it looks like there are footnotes that are here because within the body, particularly the, the, where, the whereas is, uh, but they're not in the body of the resolution. So I would hope that the uh, the person who drafted it, Mr. Pike Porter, uh, could assist in uh, us putting in to the um, uh, the a, a number resolution form uh, the actual footnotes that would give citation because I do think that if if those sources are there, then we need to put them down there. And if their quotes are, if they're not cited, then we need to put them in because that's just something that's important for its purpose. I, um, I, I think it would be best for um, this count, this committee to be the sponsor. I am willing to be a sponsor if it would not come out of the committee and just do it on my own. But I, I think that if you all agree that this is something worthy of, uh, of adoption, that you will join me and it would be a great, um, much greater impact and import. I would also say as long as we got it, um, that Jimmy Lee's um, remarks and his requests uh, I think are meaningful and significant. And I, I know enough of the political process and the pushback, uh, having tried to push envelopes uh, to their natural limits and beyond. So um, I think that it would be appropriate for us to ask for a legal opinion, probably from the council that assists the the um, the airport as opposed to the city attorney's office it's sort of like they, they contract for things because this relates to FAA stuff um, uh, regulations and what have you um, but a legal opinion as well as an opinion from uh, BIA management about their thoughts on this um, we will logically get those questions so we might as well ask for for that, and I would say that included in that would be uh, there was reference to there being an ordinance, you know, being ordinances to effectuate that. We do have a section of our um, municipal code of ordinances on airport, on, on airline, on airports. It is silent as to this type of activity. So, a legal opinion that would. Um, also include how that would be implemented, I think would be, um, and maybe even draft language that would be based on this would be, um, I think appropriate and would be the right next step on that. And I, I do not think that inaction is the right next step. So on either one of these areas. That's what I've got to say. I can make motions, but let's you guys. I'm happy. I'm happy to go next. Um, the um, so I am I am supportive of the second resolve clause, the one that uh, calls for um, calculating uh, the carbon impacts. Um, I think I agree with those who. Um, 
say that we're not counting everything as accurately as we need to be, and there should be carve outs. Um, not to say that those things aren't there. I, in, the, in the case of McNeil, that's the way they count commissions for biomass is when you cut, not when you burn. But I think we need to be cognizant of, of the impacts of the stack. In the case of the airport, we know we have this carbon accreditation uh, certification process underway. Um, and I have asked Nick um, and about trying to make sure that the guard is involved in this process. I wish um, we had Nick here tonight. Um, I actually asked him this morning if he could attend this meeting tonight. And I just, I was probably late trying to get him looped in. But um, I still plan to follow up with him on that particular aspect because I don't know where they are since their last update to this committee um, with that process. And, um, and I would be interested to know if the, basically the intent of the, um, the second resolve clause is incorporated into that work. And so I would like to know that. Um, but uh, I, I don't know that I can support the resolution as, as, as a whole, but I am supportive of the county part at this, at this point in time. I agree with Mark. Um, I definitely think that getting more data is important, but I don't know if I would support the current resolution. I would love to have to hear the objections to the first resolve clause and to the resolution and, and any other aspects of it. I would, I would like to hear it. I think the public would like to hear it as well. Uh, certainly, I'd be happy to talk to it. I don't think that this committee can, and the city council um, are in a position right now to tell the I would like to understand the, the contracts that we have with the guard. I'm not sure that we want to tell them to stand their aviation mission yet. I mean, this is a broader discussion than, than just within this committee. I, I, so I, I'm not, I, I don't know that I'm supportive of that. Yeah, I mean, I think we, there have been concerns in the past of the council and committees using language saying we're directing another entity to do something. Like that, that always ends up being an issue. And so I would rather work that out before it going to a full council vote. I just imagine that will be an issue. So my, my, my response is that is that we are asking, we, are, we would be calling on them to work collaboratively with us to draft the specific we're not making them do anything. In effect, calls on is the same as requests. One could be so bold as to say pleads, but um, this is, I think, more appropriate. So um, I hear that. Sometimes you have to get intransigent people's attention and Sometimes uh, that can be done with softer language, but usually is not. So I, that's the substantive um, response that I have with, um, with your um, position, Councillor King. Um, and I don't actually think that this is um, calling for the elimination. Uh, we did hear public testimony about the elimination of um, the the flight, but it does it, it, it mentions a lit to eliminate aviation and greenhouse gas emissions. Maybe that can only be happening by just not having them fly. But uh, so. Does it does it go as far as you are you are critiquing? Um, I don't know, but I I do think that planning for this is important, and I do think that them trying to do everything that can be done 
to reduce the number of flights is important. Um, we all experience them every day. Um, so I am comfortable with this. I'd be curious if there was language from either of you um, that to, to amend the resolve clauses. Also, if you had any um, concerns about the, uh, the whereas clauses, besides the fact that attribution needs to uh, to be included so um i actually after hearing you say that i think i feel more comfortable with the resolution as it is right now i am still wanting i know we might move slower than people like me do sometimes but um i would like to know i would be supportive of the second clause, but I'm not sure the second result clause still. Um, I am not, I'd like to know where where we are and if there have been discussions and if DTANG has been um, working to uh, provide their you know, accounting of greenhouse gas emissions with the airport in their carbon accreditation process. Um, so that's the second. The second result clause. So I, I'd like to actually do that. Do that work and get that information from Jeff. Is that prior to a um, the introduction or yeah, I mean that's the that's just the part of this resolution I'm supportive of it's here tonight. I'm not supportive of the first resolve clause. So is there no change to the first resolve clause that there, there's there's you could support not, nothing that I can Come up with on the fly right now. No. Um, not even. You're asking. Not even. Me. No. Not not language. Not necessarily drafting, but conceptually. I don't know that I that I am on board with ending the guards aviation mission here or eliminating their aviation mission. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I'm not. I guess. So yeah, if you're looking for a path to committee sponsorship of this resolution, um, there isn't one with my uh, endorsement and sponsorship. But it doesn't mean we couldn't move something like this. So I we'll okay. Um, then. It would be great if there was a way that, that we were to look at that, but if, but if not, but if not, I want to be more deliberate than that than, than yeah. doing this on the floor, anyways. And like I said, I still have questions about where we are with that second resolve clause, and then we may not be anywhere, but we may actually we may, before I may, before I move to uh, to have an endorsement of this. Um, the questions that you're having. Um, do they, you, you, you don't need to have them answered before in terms of the second. The I, would, I would answers. like to, if, if they're doing the work, if we, I mean, that's the only part of this that I support right now. If they're doing the work, there's no reason for the council to call upon because we sort of asked for this in our prior meeting. Except that this does talk about based up the an annual provision. So whether they and, and making that um, I mean I guess the annual part would be maybe more wiggly than, than is anticipated in the accreditation process that because um, we had asked for two things that were not part of the accreditation process. One was to count emissions above three thousand feet, yeah. which we had and and to include um the, the Vermont Air National Guard's contribution, which I believe in the, well, in the accreditation process as presented isn't required for military aircraft, but we'd asked for that. Um, and so we know we've seen, we've seen the, three, the above 3,000 feet uh, emissions. Um, the point is to incorporate that. And I know that 
as director of the was talking with the guard, and I just would like to know where those are and what they have committed to um, providing, and whether or not it's, I don't know if it's on an annual basis or just um, as part of the accreditation cycle, which I don't believe like, is annually, but it's something less frequent than that. So the one concern that I've got in the, um, the first resolve clause has to do with the, the date by which a specific plan would be um, drafted. And I appreciate the need in emergencies to act promptly, but I, I, that is not a realistic time for this all to happen. Uh, so I would um, be interested in amending that to April 1st because I just, I understand how slow everybody is. And um, with that change in this and with the need to get the citations included in that and switching these, the order around, I would move for the committee to sponsor this and send it back to the city council for its uh, consideration and, and a vote. I would second that. Is there any more discussion? As always. Um, no more discussion. We can take a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I am opposed. So I don't know if Maddie's here recording this or that we're just yikes. <laughs> Get our staff. This is my but we will assume that that um she knows our love because we're telling the court. So that passes on a two to one vote. Can I um make clear and I would be willing to uh to draft this that might and it may be that sort of a reconsideration, but that we also add a um, either within the resolve clauses or in a separate one, which I think is probably more likely, um, inviting the uh, the guard to come to a to a meeting to discuss this. Yeah, so if that needs a yeah, we can get that on our agenda. And then we would get this on the agenda, but I'd like to put this on in the uh, in the uh, in the resolution that we adopted. If we need to formally reconsider and then go through all of that dog and pony, or if we can know, just, it, it's all good. Maker in the second. Yeah. There uh, we go. Or, or perfect. Open to that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So that brings us to our next, uh, if there's nothing else on that, there isn't, no. The next item is um, 5.5, which was added. Uh, oh, 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 I, I'm, I'm sorry. I did ask about the asking for a legal opinion um, and the uh, Department of Nick's opinion about what Jimmy had said. I think that's, that's something I asked for. Yeah. Great. So I would move that we um, get, a legal opinion. get a legal opinion um, from the airport's council um, and also from the um, director on the, um, on the on the remarks and remarks. you know and the um, the proposal to um, ad adopt. The recommendation to change yes. the remarks. Yeah. I'm Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So, while you did you catch all what was happening? Or shall you? Sorry, yeah. I was my computer was going to die and there's a lack of ports to plug into. But um, 
I can watch the. Okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you, we, we voted on the resolution and on a two to one vote. Um, Councilors Bergman and, and King were supportive, and I was not. Um, they're moving this to the council as a two sponsored resolution. And then we just moved to get a legal opinion um, from the airports airport. councils and the airport director. And the airport director on the remarks, the recommendations and the remarks that James Lewis provided to us today. That was, that was unanimous. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Okay. We're moving along. Um, so our next item is 5.5, which we added to the agenda. This is McNeil Next Steps. Um, and so I sort of, the one thing that I definitely wanted to uh, consider was that we had a, um, an offer after the symposium to, I get my notes here. Uh, Joe Nelson has offered to provide tours to uh, those areas being managed and they're sending one to McNeil. Um, and we want it, we want, I think we've all expressed interest in, in doing that just to get that bit of information and education um, ahead of some other decisions we're going to be making at some point on district energy. So, um, so the floor is open for just processing some some of that and, and giving thoughts. I will say that um, it does appear that as and, and Joe has said he wanted he would do small tours. Um, he said is I think he said eight to ten um, was a max, or maybe he said five to eight. I don't recall now. But anyway, small numbers. Um, so there's that. And the other thing is we're cognizant of open meeting law and having um, a quorum of of, of committee members there without the meeting being worse. So um, he's, when we expressed that concern to him, he said he would do multiple smaller, smaller groups. Um, and my feeling is we might want to take him up on that. And if there were some times we could figure out who could go when, and then if there were other members um, of the public or would we need to warn it as a meeting? If it's just, if we wanted to open it up to small groups and we could have a sign up and. I, I, I think we have open meeting law problems with uh, restricting access. It's sort of like you can, oh, oh, yeah. Um, I, I don't see it. So could uh, what, so there's no way this could work other than it was one on one or something. I think that that's right. I think that um, if uh, we, um, I mean, you could do it as a work session, but I don't think that you know you can exclude the public. I mean, you can limit the public's actual participation, but you cannot limit their presence. So in, in something like a work session. So um, I, don't, I, I don't, I don't think you can do it without with the core. Right, but if each of us were to attend a tour yeah. in, independent of the others, yes. and would we be able to have others join us on those without? Sure. Without, without I mean, any other, Members of the public, the public could join, or or other counselors could if they didn't they didn't comprise a quorum of the council. But yeah. if there are limits to the number on the tour, and if it's a first come first serve, would we want to follow that? I don't think so. I, I, as long as you don't, it, it's not a meeting of a public body, then we're we're good. Okay. Um, then I would uh, on this particular next step, I would propose. That we engage Joe and um, and propose that, to him. and then I, and I'd be happy to do that. That would be great. great. Yeah. Um, and then so now it's open for further discussion of other next steps. I think 
we need to have a conversation here at the very least we probably may be needing a bigger room um, to talk about district energy and, and get questions out there, things that we're not um, directly asked. To formulate additional questions um, or just to have a forum to ask those questions? I think a forum to ask questions, I mean, we did when we started this process, I'm looking at an early iteration of questions that we had, like the McNeil lifespan, uh, you know, uh, renewable energy credits has, right. has come up, uh, district energy, um, some of those, I, I, yes, I, I, I think we had some piece of a form of it, but that is, I think, something we want to, to really get more clarity about. So, uh, I mean, what I have is the, the questions that we had come up with originally. I don't have any additional ones, but perhaps uh, other members of the public uh, uh, and us can uh, figure that out, you know, additional questions. I mean, I think it would be fine to give folks another opportunity to get answers. I actually do have additional questions, which are like around McNeil's role in the bigger power generation ecosystem, you know, and so yeah, and uh, I'd like to dig into that a little bit more as well. And that sort of, it's part of the, the question we've all heard around, if not McNeil, then what yeah. else take, would take, take its place um, in a phase out plan, which isn't specifically around district energy, but just more about uh, the plant life cycle. You know, when is it, you know, when, you know, how long it might be used it might be. Um, and so I want to understand more about that, uh, more than what we can glean from the BEP website and, and some of the other information. So to have a place to ask those questions more directly. Yeah. Um, and then I'm not sure if we need more independent expertise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah but we, we might need another, another, I don't know. If it's like, at, like it's after that. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and to be quite, Honest, I think we need a bigger room, and I, I am not opposed for asking these questions of BED to have it at BED. Uh, you know, I, I, we're, you know, they've got big rooms there, and um, it would be them that would be providing answers at our meeting so the public would get a chance to, to talk, but we're getting information from them. Uh, and what we do with that is um, is a next step for us. But, um, so I'm in favor of that. One other thing that I am very interested in is whether um, the medical center or UVM has explored geothermal as an alternative to um, this plant, the, this steam pipe slash district heating approach. Um, so that might just be a question. Right. Somebody, but I'm not exactly sure who. So, um, would we maybe endeavor to hold some agenda planning sessions outside of this meeting to like we had done prior to the symposium where we talk about um, you know the kinds of things that we would like to do and where and how we might like to have the meeting and 
you might want to have a tent. Um, so we could do that. And then maybe between now and I don't know if we can do it between the, now and our July meeting, so two, we might be able to give it a go. Wanted to figure that out. We could also do something on Zoom if it was hard to get us all together in one place. Um, or by email, even, you know, or, in, or all of the above, like the year and I were doing with Gene. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in early, mid July, I'm, I'm around, but we were in camping the Sunday through Thursday of, in July. And, you know, not even be in a cell friendly place. I'm going to be out um, the fifth through the maybe fifth, sixth or fifth or sixth through like a week from that ish. So probably for the July meeting is not that we're right. If we're meeting on the are we meeting on the twenty fifth. Yes, we're meeting the, the next. Or we'll talk about that's what that's on our plan. But I'm assuming we'll meet um, the fourth Tuesday of July. Yeah, yeah. I think we should rush the planning conversation I'm in the weeks late in August. Let me be more intentional about like there's not really a need for us to like rush and be like we want to do these type of things. So, like let's have a bigger conversation about it. Right. There's also been a request uh, that was brought up at the council by Councilor Carpenter, and it was asked of me uh, by President Paul, and I haven't talked to her yet. Um, she sent me a text yesterday, I think, um, basically asking about a work session on McNeil. Um, and in terms of the sequencing of these things, it seems like we want to have another, do we want to have another, do we want to get more of our questions answered before we have a council work session. And so that would drive the scheduling of, of that. We're going to move into August on, you know, have have something planned for August, or is that what we're saying? I mean, I guess the question is also, when is uh, BPD looking to come to the council? Right. And I don't think there's clarity on that yet. I will, I will, I can take that away and, and ask uh, Darren um, and maybe the administration. I don't know who decides, who decides when to bring that forward. Um, but I know that he is out for at least. Okay, so let's plan to talk about scheduling a scheduling meeting. Okay. Sometime soon once we get an question answered. Okay. And that seems good. And we can use the same process we used before where we circulate email amongst us and all as well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. And I will get back to both of you once I uh, trade some more email or talk to to uh, Joe. Awesome. Joe Nelson. Okay, we're moving along now. Next on our agenda, if I can find it, is a uh, director's report. All right, I'm gonna make it very quick. Um, goals and objectives. Every year we work with the commission to develop our kind of annual goals and objectives on which the commission evaluates my performance and that of the city engineer, Norm Baldwin, is also an appointee. That document's on the commission website. If you have any feedback for us, the draft document was given to them last month at this month at their June meeting. We'll be looking to have the uh, commission refine it in July. Uh, July 1 is also a big day because it's the last day, uh, the first day of the new prohibition of recycling bins. And so now toters will be required in any effort you can do to help the last remaining bin users to get their toter at Public Works would be appreciated so that things go as smoothly as possible. My Thank neighbor doesn't person. talk to me. He's so rude. So I don't think that I can help the one person who lives right across the street from me. Yeah. You, but sorry. So just question on process for that. Just because I still 
yeah, see a lot sure. of folks in Ward 8, especially because most of them are renters. Would a renter come and get it, or is that something I does it matter? Like, does it have it to doesn't really matter? Or? Okay, yeah, we sell them at a 50 percent uh subsidy and they're affordable 20 25 dollars so um if we prefer the landlord gets them so that they kind of stay with the unit and that the landlord's committed to uh managing it but uh tenants can pick it up too okay. um gmt uh council berkman and, and others have been pushing me to represent uh, a desire for transit financing efforts uh, I have continued to bring that up uh, and am still bringing that up with the organization. It, the organization is struggling right now to manage a couple major items. One is driver shortage and is having a hard time meeting all of its root requirements with the staff that we have. The board took the unusual step at the last meeting to raise wages outside of a contract negotiation session. In the midst of a, an agreement, to raise wages to try to get more mechanics and drivers in the door. And um, the organization is also transitioning to collecting fares as of Jan, Jan 1, and there's all the fare box procurement installation. That said, I will continue to advocate. I've already met with the new GMT uh, commissioner that you all appointed, uh, Andrea Suozo, and she seems enthusiastic and committed. Uh, so I will continue to advocate for the regional study, but it is having a hard time kind of finding the focus to launch. Will Anderson was the uh, is, alternate. Is the alternate? Have you have you reached out to him? I have copied him on an email to the general manager to have the general manager schedule. I have not met with him yet, but I will. Very important. He's a fiscal analyst for the state, and perhaps which is why I was pushing for right. him that he, you could get him on that sustainable study and Perfect. use that wonkiness, right? To use the best. talent for yes, yes. our efforts. Yes, because uh, we got to pay for this thing. Perfect. And then lastly, uh, bike share, the pub press release just went out this afternoon. The launch will be Thursday. Bird is the new vendor. Katma is running it. There are seven partners. There will be 200 bikes around the community starting as of Thursday. If bikes are misparked, there's information in the press release and on the app about how to address that, those issues. Let me know what you're hearing from the community as this uh, project rolls out. Those are quick updates. I'll give you a brief Champlain Parkway update when we get there. Okay. Um, council updates. The one thing I just had a meeting with um, a, a South Burlington city councilor and asked him if he would be willing to come here to share his experience and information regarding their solar ordinance that they just passed. That we said we'd be more than happy to do that. It's actually a building code uh, in, in there. In, in South Burlington, it's uh, in their zoning because they don't really have building codes, but they've got it under the, the zoning code. But yeah, and, and it's part of the state building codes. So they just took the solar uh, aspect of that uh, construction and brought it in here. But um, uh, and they're taking a bunch of our stuff on weatherization. So it's a good fertilization. So I would like for us to schedule him for maybe the July meeting to have that conversation with the hope that we could come up with a um, uh, with an ordinance. And perhaps Chapin, you know, this is not you anymore. This is Bill Ward. Yes. I'm sorry, dating myself. <laughs> we can get uh, uh, somebody from permitting and inspections here to hear that comment because I do not believe that we have a, a similar code to what they've just done. But so we would you would ask uh, someone from permitting inspections to be here with yeah. the yeah. Uh, South Carolina City Council and yes. hear, hear their presentation yeah. as mm -hmm. and be available to ask questions. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, I like that idea. I don't know if we can fit it in July yet or not, but um, I'm open to that if we can. 
if not July, August. Right, somewhere, uh, somewhere. August, September. <laughs> No, I no, I no, I would like that. I was uh, when you brought that up during yeah during the uh, whole council meeting. I was intrigued by that. Uh, I mean, I I the south end zoning rezoning this district. I mean, they're going to be eight stories high. They should be lead platinum, and they should be solar roofed, and all the other good stuff. They're going to be that big, yeah. Okay, so that's that's my big. Oh, and I I do think that in light of the conversation you're we having about McNeil, that getting um, more information and perhaps getting uh, Darren to talk about the uh, potential for a solar project on the old city dump, and maybe having Cindy White. Chief and Spencer and Darren Springer come here and have a conversation about that. So those are we need a parking lot for meeting topics, but I guess it is in our minutes now. Since Maddie is our parking attendant, we have a SharePoint document that we manage all this so we don't lose our minds. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Otherwise, I would. I was crazy. even even less than I am losing my mind. Yeah. I'm like last. Wow, so like, <laughs> I got it under control. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and my only update is I since the um, since the symposium have been have been digging into electricity generation. I mentioned it at the council meeting, but I find it fascinating that there's this whole hidden world um, or hidden to me prior to the symposium and the follow on reading I've been doing about. Right about about power, electric power, and uh, and so I'm just going to put pitch these two books. One I'm just finishing uh, by uh, called "Shorting the Grid" by Meredith Anglin, and it's just it's one of those ones that is um, it's disturbing and like revelatory at the same time. That starts. <laughs> it is especially coming on the heels of the symposium, which is sort of like. And then, um, and then this this other one that Pike had suggested in an email to us, "No Miracles Needed" by Mark Jacobson, is one um, that I'm just beginning. So we so should have a book club. We have a book club. I'm looking for book club members. <laughs> it's hard to find takers. We're talking about sometimes uh, our agenda does feel like a book club. Mm -hmm. To be fair, mm -hmm. um, so that that those are my updates. I'm still continuing to sort of. To dig in and try to educate myself on um, on information and facts around all these decisions that we're going to have before us someday soon. Um, so with that we'll we'll move on. Our next meeting is our uh, I think we said earlier we'll move, uh, try to do it on seven twenty five, which is the fourth Tuesday in July. And um, with that, if that's agreeable to everybody. We'll move on to the Champlain Parkway. Yeah. Is no longer a walk. That's right, no longer a walk. Uh, I will make this less than five minutes. So, the reason I wanted to have a walk with you all is one to celebrate the progress that has been made and give you an opportunity to walk safely on a construction site and see the new alignment and how it's coming along. But also, second, work is now going to be pivoting to Lakeside and Pine Street this. Uh, in the next couple of weeks. As a matter of fact, work on Lakeside was uh, occurring last couple of days. And the, the work that's happening around the Maltex and the, the cutting, is that part of it as well? Yes, they are uh, removing the uh, rail siding in preparation for turning that space into a shared use path. Uh, so, we are now pivoting to a much more public phase of the project with significant traffic uh, impacts. So we are planning to have a public meeting in July to lay out this season's construction schedule. We are sending out front porch forum direct targeted emails to particular neighborhoods along Pine Street as this work gets underway. Feel free to pass along any concerns. We do have a mailing list that we send out weekly updates to. Are we not going to get out, be able to get out of town on the, the south, the, 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 uh, on this west side? Uh, you will be able to get out of town on Rush, 
rush hours, it will be two lane, uh, two way traffic. Uh, during off peak uh, times, there will be some alternating traffic on Pine Street and on Lakeside. So um, the great news is this project is progressing well. Pine Street will be getting granite curves, elevated crosswalks, uh, intersections, new crosswalks, a shared use path, a lot of amenities that have been held up since uh, Gene and I were in different roles here in the city. So um, if you hear anything, let us know. I want to communicate uh, as well as we can what's coming this work this season is expected to get to substantial completion for this initial construction contract, which means then the conversation is what do we do about the final construction contract? So that's not a discussion for today, but in coming months, we'll need to talk about that. Rail yard, what's going on with the railroad yard? Rail yard enterprise project is um, working through its environmental permit, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, permits, the federal permit, we are expecting to wrap that up and have a preferred alternative that not only we have selected, which is alternative 1B, which is that kind of battery limited connection route, um, but wanting federal highway and VTRANS and us to all be in alignment and to have federal highway uh, kind of concurring that this is a viable and preferred alternative. We expect to have that in the fall, October, is our current timeline. And that's are, looking good? I am, yes, it is looking good to having that be the preferred alternative. Right now, the Federal Highway in the city and VTRANS really are looking at a situation where there's one feasible alternative other than the no build. And that one feasible alternative other than the no build is alternative 1B. So the risk is that through this process, that the no build alternative could be selected through the environmental review process. Yeah. It's my hope that we do not end up there. I don't want to vote no on the final contracts. Please tell them I'll have to eat $50 million in debt or more because I'm not supporting them. Let's, let's go. Do you have any sense of how, like, like the prospects for alternative one day is are they pretty good or do you think you know i believe that it um is the right solution if we have done our duty to narrow the design to the greatest extent possible to minimize the amount of pavement the length of pavement we're really just trying to get the multimodal connection between pine and battery We've talked a lot with the stakeholders. Alternative 1B is the grand compromise. Every property owner along the corridor gets impacted somewhat with the understanding that we're all in this together. There's no right of way there now. We've got to take or acquire rights to create a road where none exists today. If one is going to succeed, it is going to be 1B. I do feel cautiously optimistic that there is a realistic project there. So we are still, you know, plugging away and committed to it and talking to VTrans and Federal Highway about can we start lining up now that new Federal Highway grant programs are being announced daily and one just came out today that um, we are looking to make the REP the next big pitch that we do. And Federal Highway and VTrans are excited about that because their contributions to date have been capped at $20 million. And I can tell you that given the mitigation environmentally, the railroad mitigation, the property rights acquisitions, the stormwater management, is that we are looking at a project well north of $20 million. As little as it is, it is an expensive little project. Essential for that neighborhood. For Okay. I'm spending a lot of my time and leadership team time on it because we agree. Thank you. Uh, and I will say with no further business, I'll adjourn us at 8.08. Beauty.